Good evening, everyone. Uh, if all goes well tonight, we'll cover many of the subjects that Tom discussed. I'm so pleased to be with you here tonight, so honored as well, to be here with Bob, who is, I would argue, one of the deepest, coolest, most thought-provoking scholars out there, a leading light in the world of um, intellectual. W will you blurb my next book? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And, uh, and we have much to dig into, so let's just start. Um, you know, you've pondered uh, existential questions for decades. You teach I don't know, meaning of life at Princeton. Um, but let's talk about the audacity of the title of your book, right? Why Buddhism mm. is True. That's, quite, that's mm. quite a statement. And I know you struggled initially with saying, okay, is that an accurate assessment of my book? Mm. Why did you go with it? I think audacity is the polite term for that title. <laughs> um, some other ones might come to mind are obnoxious and, and things like that. Um, it only occurred to me at the very end uh, the, of, of, you know, I didn't, I didn't start writing the book with that title in mind. Um, I kind of realized that I had kind of mounted an argument uh, that Buddhism is true. I should, I should qualify that with a couple of things. Um, first of all, I'm talking about the naturalistic part of Buddhism, not, not the, uh, the more exotically metaphysical or some might say supernatural parts like rebirth. Um, but the parts of uh, Buddhist psychology and philosophy that are amenable to kind of evaluation from the standpoint of modern science and philosophy. So claims about the human mind, the sources of human suffering. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm basically arguing, not that I have myself had any particular special deep insight after meditating for weeks or anything, and... and that's not the reason uh, I feel I can make a claim this strong. It's because of um, developments that have happened in psychology uh, in particular. Psychology, uh, certainly including evolutionary psychology, which I had written about before. So the argument is that because of developments over the last few decades in these fields, it's possible to mount a, a, a new kind of argument uh, in defense of uh, Buddhist psychology and philosophy. Um, and, and to just stay on the macro level for a moment, this idea that you posited in a couple of articles that um, Eastern philosophies have been sort of dismissed and, uh, right. and in favor of Western enlightenment and rationalism, but you're sort of reevaluating it in that context. Yeah, I mean, this was actually, uh, I should admit, that this is it's a piece I wrote in the New York Times, uh, the Well blog. And I have to admit that it was in response to a piece about the book in The New Yorker that I wasn't completely delighted about, which kind of complained, uh, oh, that I didn't spend enough time on kind of the poetry of Buddhism, and I spent too much, I was too analytical, and maybe trying to tackle a subject analytically that isn't amenable to analysis in a certain sense. And my reply in that Times piece was that actually, that I think this is a common misconception about Buddhist uh, philosophy and, and maybe Eastern philosophy generally is, and I, I, I said in a way I think this attitude could be labeled Orientalism. I don't know if you're familiar with the term. It comes from Edward Said. Uh, and, and the idea behind Orientalism is that it's a way Westerners look at traditions from the East uh, that is in a certain sense condescending. That, uh, it's like, yeah, they're nice, they're, they're, they're cute, and, 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 and they have these aesthetic virtues, but they're not as rigorous as Western thought. And I argued that, no, when you look at Buddhist philosophy and psychology, it's, it's very rigorous. Now, it's true that the claims it makes are radical. So, for example, the idea that the self doesn't exist, which is I spend a fair amount of time on in the book, that's a radical claim about both psychology and, in a certain sense, metaphysics. And you spend a lot of time looking at natural selection at Darwinism and what we know about modern psychology and you look at it from sort of Buddhist traditions or mm -hmm. certainly from mindfulness traditions. Yeah, um, I mean I, I argue that, uh, I mean there's an appendix at the end of the book because I felt so defensive about the title, at the, kind of at, toward the end I wrote an appendix that actually lists Buddhist claims that I think are true, at least true in the sense that science ever says things are true. In other words, you know, uh, to the extent that we can tell right now, I mean, you know, uh, scientific theories are never proven. They're just the, 
they have uh, a lot of corroborating evidence. And I listed these things that I think uh, uh, qualify as, as very credible claims made by Buddhism. And I, and I said in there, but in a way, the one sentence answer uh, to the question of why is Buddhism true is because we are animals created by natural selection. So I do think that if you look at the way natural selection, well, first of all, there are certain features of the way it builds any animal brains that, that uh, Buddhism really uh, reckons with. For example, the fact that gratification tends to evaporate. I think that's true of all animals, and, and it's uh, the reason so much of the quest for happiness as ordinarily conducted is if not futile, uh, you know, not as, <laughs> not as uh, profitable as you might hope, because you, you, get, you, you get the thing you're pursuing, the pleasure evaporates. So that, that's a product of our just being animals. And then there's these specific things that are products of our being human animals. So that brings us to powdered donuts. Uh, and in your yeah. case, dark chocolate. Uh, and both. Those... I actually have issues with both. Yeah. I see. Okay. <laughs> this is turning into a confessional. Yeah. Uh, but those cravings are something that's indicative and charted on MRIs in modern psychology, but something that one can find an antidote for in meditation. Yeah, well, I mean, in a way, it's the, uh, you know, the, the Buddhist uh, term dukkha, which when you hear that the Buddha emphasized that there's a lot of suffering in life, uh, I don't think he ever quite said life is suffering, which is the standard paraphrasal, but certainly emphasized the pervasiveness of, the, of, of suffering. But the term dukkha that's translated as suffering, a lot of scholars would say you could almost translate it as unsatisfactoriness, or, or certainly it has a strong connotation of unsatisfactoriness. And, and so the idea is that a big part of suffering is just the fact that Whatever, at every moment, you want things to be a little better. You, you, you eat the donut, it feels good for a while, and then you want another one. And that's uh, a big part of what uh, Buddhism addresses. And I think meditation helps you become aware of how pervasive this, this really is. You know, I, one great thing about mindfulness meditation is I just think it's a very good form of introspection. It makes you aware of mental dynamics you weren't aware of. And uh, I think it can make you aware of how many problematic, you know, how much of suffering does boil down to always wanting things to be a little, can this be a little better? This feels a little uncomfortable. And, and, and my, that, you say, is a product of our, our Darwinian sort of it's evolution, a, evolutionary any, psychology. Any animal's evolution. I mean, when you think about it, it's like if you're natural selection and you're designing an animal that's, whose job is to get genes into the next generation, of course, natural selection is not a conscious designer, but it does create animals that look as if they were designed to get genes into the next generation. Well, if you imagine an animal that, like, it has one meal and then just goes, whoa, that was great, and then just sits there contented forever, <laughs> I mean, it'll starve to death, right? The, the hunger has to return, and, and the same is true. You know, it's a very competitive game, natural selection. <clears throat> um, it's, you, you mentioned the four noble truths, uh, you know, and overcoming some of the, mm -hmm. the thirst, the craving, the hungers. Uh, yeah, well, the, the, the uh, four noble truths basically, they, they, they assert that, first of all, there is the problem of suffering and that at the core of the problem uh, is this word tanha, T-A-N-H-A, which can be translated as thirst or the way to the end of suffering is to, I mean, I'm not, this isn't exactly the four, the four noble truths one by one, but, but the upshot is that uh, there is a way to come to terms with the problem of tanha, of, 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 of just endless thirst and craving. And then the way to do that is the Eightfold Path, uh, so-called. And uh, the last the Eightfold Path is a bunch of things that start with, as it's traditionally translated, with right. Right livelihood, right understanding, and so on. And the last two are, uh, one of them is mindfulness, and one of them is concentration. Right mindfulness, right concentration. So both of those refer to uh, meditation. Uh, so mindfulness meditation is, uh, you know, we, we think of it uh, sometimes as this secular therapeutic things. It's sometimes taught that way, and I think that's a fine way to teach it. Uh, but um, it has very deep roots in, in Buddhism. Mindfulness is not just some, some fad. Let's, let's sort of delineate, sort of, and maybe even define some of the broader terms, because I've read that you don't actually label yourself a Buddhist, although you are practicing meditation. Mm -hmm. um, you 
would ar I would argue you're an atheist. Mm. Uh, so if you could delineate for us the spiritual versus, you know, the, the faith tradition versus the secular aspect of Buddhism. Well, I mean, as for the atheism question, I would call myself an agnostic who thinks there's reason to believe that there is a larger purpose unfolding on the planet for that. But, but that I, I believed and even argued before, um, uh, before I got into Buddhism. At the, the reason I say at the end of the book that I don't call myself a Buddhism a, or a Buddhist is just because, um, you know, in Asia, Buddhism is a very different thing from the Western Buddhism that, that a lot of us in America think of as I, I mean, the, the American stereotype of, of Buddhism is they meditate and they don't believe in God. Actually, in Asia, it's roughly the opposite. Almost no Asian Buddhists meditate. Many monks do, but some monks don't. Um, the, uh, uh, and they do believe in deities, although not an, all, all, an omnipotent creator God. And, and anyway, the, the, the point is that now, there's also this, this whole psychology and philosophy, which I uh, deal with in the book. But, but a, you know, I, I just w worry that if I come out and call myself a Buddhist because I meditate every morning and it is a meditation informed by Buddhist philosophy, it is. But still, if I were an Asian Buddhist, I might, I, I just might think, you know, I, I, you know, you've all heard the term cultural appropriation, probably. It's a big concern. I'm personally not. Uh, cultural appropriation obsessive. It's like, I, you know, I, I don't go around worrying about, you know, who's playing the blues and stuff, but um, uh, it's a serious issue. I don't, want, I don't mean to belittle it. It's, no. just, it's just not something I spend a lot of time on, but I did feel in this one case that uh, I, it might be seen as disrespectful um, if I went around calling myself a Buddhist, but I'm fine with Western Buddhists who call themselves that. My, just by, by uh, full disclosure, my mother is a practicing Buddhist. I'm a Jew. Um, there's a lot of confusion in our household. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I do find it interesting. I know you were raised Baptist, and you, you know, sort of taught at Union Theological Seminary, and it's, it's something that you've considered. So I, it, it was a mm -hmm. question I thought was worth asking. But let me get back for a moment to the issue of cravings. You have a whole chapter about how it's not about discipline or willpower, um, it's something deeper than that. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I was critiquing the idea that willpower is like, is, is like this muscle that you have to exercise to make it better. I mean, it's true that it kind of does work like that in the sense that the more you successfully exercise what we call self-restraint, um, the, the probably the better you'll get at it. But, but there is a somewhat different approach which consists of, and this has been used in like uh, helping people quit smoking and it's been shown that it can be effective, uh, which consists of rather than like stealing yourself to like fight the urge, you actually would let the urge arise, like the urge to smoke a cigarette or the urge to do anything else, and then try to observe it mindfully, which you'll be better at if you do a lot of mindfulness meditation. It's not easy to do that. I mean, our, our cravings and our emotions generally are kind of designed to get us to do their bidding without us reflecting on them and, and, and exerting any kind of uh, autonomy. Um, but if you do that, if you, if you just observe, let the, let the urge arise and observe it, but don't give it the reinforcement of smoking the cigarette or whatever, or whatever the thing is, um, whatever the payoff is, that that's a very effective way to disempower the urge over time. It's a slightly alternative approach that that implies a different model of the way the mind works, which maybe we'll have time to, to get into. Which is a little bit of a workaround. It's a little bit of a short circuit, because you talk about a lot of the science, the modern science, and the understanding of cognition, right? The idea that here's your brain, here's your brain on chocolate, and you, you, there's a lot of MRI imaging going on looking at the uh, in fact, impact of like you're given money and you're about to buy something and the impact of your brain of that purchase, right? right. And so this idea that, that meditation can help you short circuit that temptation, yeah. the, the, yeah. the slave to passions as you would call yeah, it. Yeah, now this is a fundamental point that Western psychology has been starting to catch on to that I think Buddhist psychology was, was in on very early which is just that the, the, the traditional distinction between cognition and affect or feeling or emotion is just misleading. And the fact is 
our, our feelings are so finely intertwined with our thoughts and our perceptions uh, that they are doing the steering. And this is what you mentioned, uh, you know, reason is the slave of passion. That, that's uh, David Hume, uh, you know, Western enlightenment philosopher who is actually kind of Buddhist. I mean, he thought the self doesn't exist and, and, and so on, but, but he did pick up on the fact that ultimately, as we ordinarily live our lives, the feelings are in charge. They are driving the thoughts. They accompany our perceptions. You see someone, you have a certain feeling about them. You don't notice it, probably, but it's going to govern the way you perceive them. You know, you're, it has, it's like, are they in the rival slot, serious rival, enemy, possible ally, ally, love, you know, it's like all these different categories of people elicit feelings that then frame the way uh, we think of them. Um, and so, uh, you know, you kind of alluded to a particular study there, I think, that I talk about in the book where it was just a demonstration that shopping behavior ultimately comes down to feeling. They did brain scans of people trying to decide whether to buy a thing. And they just showed that, you know, it's like they, they looked at, um, you know, uh, when you looked at how much it cost, how bad did that make you feel? When you looked at the thing itself, how good did that make you feel? And, you know, did the, the pleasure centers and the, the different centers of the brain that light up? And it just comes down to a contest of feelings. And, um, and, that, and that's uh, David Hume himself emphasized that. And I think mindfulness meditation both makes you aware of how pervasively feelings influence your thought and your perception and allow you to do something about it. So in the Western tradition, you, you argue, you've argued in articles that the Western Enlightenment alone can't save the universe. You have another audacious claim that meditation can save America. Yeah. Well, this was actually, it's a piece I just did for Wired about um, Steve Pinker's new book, Enlightenment Now. It's a bestseller. Um, and he's very aware of, like, the cognitive bias problem, like confirmation bias, um, and the fact that, uh, you know, we, confirmation bias is just that, you know, we're very, we notice evidence that supports our pre-existing views. Uh, we don't notice evidence, or we easily dismiss evidence that, is contrary to our views. And I should say, I mean, all of this fits squarely in the, in the great problem of our time, the kind of tribalism, the political tribalism in America, where both sides look at or seeing the evidence that supports their view and, um, and, uh, and so on. And, and I said... And the irony is that this is an ancient faith that is perhaps perfectly timed for our age, this idea mm -hmm. that what you get at in the book is that evolutionary psychology is, is explains the tribalism that exists yeah. in our thinking. We are designed uh, to associate with groups and to identify groups that are threatening and to process information about them accordingly, which means in a biased, distorted way that reinforces our view that we're right and we deserve to win and they deserve to lose. The, I think these things are built pretty uh, deeply into the human uh, mind uh, and they work very subtly. Um, and, and the point I made in this, in this piece about Steve Pinker's book was, in his book, he says, okay, we have these cognitive biases and there's these things you can do, like you can be aware of like certain kinds of fallacies that, that you may be prone to and so on. And, and I think that's all fine, but I still think there is nothing uh, as effective as a practice that makes you aware that like when you're on social media and you see a tweet or a Facebook item and you want to share it because it supports the, your, your tribe's view, and so you feel the urge to, to share it, it is an urge. It's a feeling. If you pay attention to what's going on, it's not like a rational decision. It's like it would feel good to click retweet. It would feel good to click share. And this is responsible for a lot of the so-called fake news problem, I think. I mean, people just uncritically share things that corroborate the pre-existing view without actually examining them. And so I'm just saying that I think, you know, and I'm I'm like your colleague at ABC, Dan Harris. I'm pretty evangelical about this. Uh, and so how does, um, I mean, we've, we've obviously got a lot of information on Facebook and how it bifurcates the audience and, and, you know, speaking in real time about what this does. How does meditation or mindfulness act as an antidote to that? Because you actually put out something called a resistance newsletter. Yeah, the Mindful Resistance Newsletter. Thank you for the plug. Uh, it's a, <laughs> it, it, that was uh, a softball. That was like this. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, the, the, uh, it's at mindfulresistance.net, or you can just Google it. That grows out, out of a piece I, I did for Vox where I, I kind of critiqued the so-called resistance against Trump. I, I think the, 
Resistance is sometimes uh, too reactive, re reacts too readily to Trump's provocations for its own good, isn't reflective enough uh, for its own good, isn't mindful in the everyday English sense of the word of just cal calmly paying attention to things and, and, and focusing on what's most important. But yeah, I do think meditation helps you uh, be like that. If, if something is happening in the news or there is a public figure who is pushing your emotional buttons, yeah. and there are some that are very yeah. good at that, you can work around it. You can. I mean, I find in general with feelings that emerge in the course of your life, like uh, it can just be you're at the checkout counter, the person in front of you is taking a long time, you're getting annoyed, you're starting to think unkind things about them because they're so slow, just a feeling like that. It, it's not a super subtle thing. You, know, you all know the feeling when I say it. But at the same time, I find that when I'm practicing meditation regularly, I'm more likely to notice it in real time when it's happening and just be able to pause and reflect on it in a way that, again, disempowers it. I mean, and, and this, this disempowering can happen with really unpleasant feelings like deep anxiety. I mean, you can, in principle, meditate on anxiety and I've had experiences where suddenly deep anxiety was something I was just viewing with detachment. It was, it was I could see where it was in my body, but it was just no longer um, painful. So I think with, with both dramatic, unpleasant feelings and subtle feelings that you're not even aware are guiding you, I think a regular meditation practice um, can help you uh, deal with them. You talk in the Vox article, I think, about how that kind of outrage and uh, emotion, getting overwhelmed with the emotion, is a disservice to those of us who, all of us, frankly, who need to examine sort of um, the, the polarization that's happening and what those real causes are of the, of yeah. the polarization. Yeah, and I think it's the, I mean, and it goes beyond America. I mean, the psychology of tribalism, I think, is, well, it's long been a great human affliction. And I think now it, uh, it's driving everything from sectarian conflict to national conflict to this uh, polarization in America. And, and technology is in some ways abetting it. It's making it easier to divide people into tribes and micro-tribes. So I, I think... Um, you know, it's critical that we, uh, that we get better at, uh, at, you know, what you call a kind of metacognition, understanding your own cognition, how it works, getting better at viewing it, and in a sense, uh, taking control. And, and I think, you know, we all think the other tribe is the problem, but I, I, we are all subject to this, to this thing, and we are all part of the problem. Can I still not like the Red Sox? <coughs> Is that okay? Uh, that is, actually, no. You cannot like the Yankees. <laughs> oh I would give you permission. Goodness. I would give you permission to, uh, I, I without sense, equivocation, yeah, just like the I Yankees. Yeah, I sense a little polarization yeah. happening on the I'm stage sorry, right I'm now. Sorry, I couldn't help you there. We were talking about um, the, the the Comey interview on Sunday night at, at ABC News. It was what we were all fixated on, and Frank Luntz, the pulse, pollster, conducted a, a watch party, mm. and. Uh, Polled Republicans and Democrats, and clearly their reaction to what was happening looked like two parallel lines. You know, it was just like inversely correlating. Inversely like, correlating, yeah. and you know. yeah, yeah. Um, clearly, an example th of the that's tribalism. The way it is, and it has really like perverse <laughs> implications. Like, all of a sudden, all these people in left on the left are like getting into kind of Cold War mode about Russia because. The guy they hate, Donald Trump, is not doing that, and they suspect it may be because the Russians have influence over him. So that's, you know, I mean, so much, it's just so much of it is governed at the personal level like this. Donald Trump is a person you hate. Whatever he likes, you hate. Whatever he hates, you like. It's not quite that simple, obviously, but, uh, but that's a good example of, of how your views are governed by uh, which, which tribe you're you're with. Give me a glimpse, give us a glimpse, if you will, of what your meditation practice looks like. Um, you know, most people who aren't meditating are intimidated at the idea of, you know, yeah. lots and lots of, I don't have time. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I'm not a natural meditator. I had to go to an actual one-week silent meditation retreat before I saw any value in it at all. Most people, happily, uh, don't have to go to such extremes, although I recommend retreats, but um, there are apps, for example, in fact, the 10% Happier app, which I uh, courtesy use. of your colleague Dan Harris uh, and other apps, um, and there are online teachers and so on. Um, you know, I my own 
practice is 30 minutes in the morning, and then periodically, and you know, sometimes that doesn't go that great. I mean, sometimes it's like, why did I spend this time? And then sometimes what will happen is late in the day, I'll be feeling like anxiety or anger or something, and I'll sit down and meditate, and that will deal with it pretty effectively. And the fact is, if I didn't have a morning practice, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be remembering to do that, and I wouldn't be as good at it. Is there a magic number? Is there a baseline number? You know, some people, uh, Dan in his most recent book advocates, uh, what is it, micro, uh, micro hits or something, yeah, yeah, yeah. micro dosing uh, uh, of uh, meditation. Uh, and, there, and, and, you know, and different things work for different people. But, yeah, I would say pausing for one minute is a good thing. And, and one, if you're having trouble sustaining a practice, one tip I got from somebody, which I think is good, is just the rule has to be that every morning, whenever your time is, you spend at least one second on the cushion. So even if you're saying, I just don't have time today, you go ahead and do the ritual of sitting down, and then you just don't lose the thread. Now, for myself, anything short of 20 minutes, I, I, like I said, I'm bad. It's like to even start focusing on many consecutive breaths could take me a while. And for me, it feels like in the morning, if I didn't do 20 minutes, uh, I'm not sure it'd be worth it. But a lot of people say that 40 minutes you know, is really like the dopamine kicks in or something. But but these things work differently for different people. Uh, I'm going to uh, call out your ADHD because you write about it in the book. Um, because everyone thinks of meditation as something that you have to focus on. Um, it's something I was drawn to for my middle son who has yeah. attention issues um, and, and seems to be helpful on yeah. that score. Yeah. Was no, that I, the case for you? Uh, I think it's helped. I think uh, now, now meditation may be harder to begin with if you have attention problems, but at the same time, I mean, it's a general truth, I think, that the people who most need meditation have the hardest time doing it. Um, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't put in the, the effort. Um, I, 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 I do think it helps. I mean, you notice that in the extreme example of like being on retreat where like at the end of a week, you're just in a totally different zone and the, the attention problems are completely gone. Um, but then you get back to the real world, and you're, you're only going to be able to hang on to some of that at most. And, and there I would say the times you may notice it are like, if you're trying to write a piece, like you're trying to write something online, you're supposed to focus on that. And then like you get to a difficult place in the writing, and your mind wants to wander, and, and you think like, you know, I could really stand to research like smartphones. I need to buy a smartphone. Whatever, whatever it is that's tempting you away is very literally a temptation. You'll notice it's a feeling, and, and it's a feeling that very much like, you know, it would feel better. It feels good. I enjoy researching smartphones, and it's very much like the desire to smoke a cigarette. If you can make yourself stop and observe it, you know, that can disempower it. So that is an act of of attention, of, of restoring attention where it might otherwise stray. Talk a little bit about, um, you know, we think of meditation is being blissed out like you know and Dan talks about all the time losing one's ambition if you're blissed out and you're not motivated mm -hmm. by anger and frustration or what have you and yet you know we, we see executives of fortune 500 companies we see you know Goldman Sachs Apple executives everybody taking to the meditation craze what do you make of that well first I'm not uh... I'm not a cynic about it there are people who uh... you know serious meditators long-standing and they don't like the way like executives in Silicon Valley uh, are using it to like get an edge and make more money. I mean, my own view is that um, the, the, it, 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 it so often just tends to be the case that meditation makes you at least somewhat easier to live with. <laughs> that, uh, that whatever your motivation, I say it's probably good that you're doing it and it may be the kind of gateway drug that le leads you to much deeper exploration of it. And, and, um, Self-exploration. Yeah, uh, yeah. If there is of, a of the practice, Sorry. And, and of yourself. Well, right. That's a whole <laughs> paradox. But, That's the but whole yeah, it, it is a process of, of self-exploration. And mm -hmm. I should say there are different kinds of meditation. I'm talking main, mainly about mindfulness meditation. I mean, there are different kinds of Buddhist meditation. Let's talk a little bit about enlightenment, the checklist uh, for enlightenment that Tom alluded to. But... Talk, uh, you talked a bit in the book about the difference between bliss and enlightenment. I thought that was illustrative. Yeah. Now, it is said, of course, in Buddhism, enlightenment is this thing that is said to lie at the end of the path. Not many people attain it, maybe, but the Buddha did. You know, enlightenment, awakening. Um, 
and it is associated with bliss. It is the end of suffering, so it's liberation from suffering and enlightenment in the sense of seeing the world clearly. And by the way, I think the most amazing claim of Buddhism is that the reason we suffer and the reason we make other people suffer is because we don't see the world clearly. That's a claim I defend in the book, and, and I think it's an amazing um, claim. But anyway, bliss is associated with enlightenment, but uh, with mindfulness meditation, the object of the game is not bliss. I mean, there, there are forms of meditation, of concentration meditation, which I've done, and they can be super blissful, and they can, they can, they can bring states of super deep bliss, and that's, that's great, but, but with, with mindfulness meditation, especially the very end associated, well, especially when it's associated with what's called Vipassana uh, meditation, which translates as insight, um, the goal is to really understand things about the world and your mind more clearly, really see things about the world and your mind more clearly. Now, that is going to tend to make you happier, is the claim, and I think it, that tends to be true. And it's going to tend to make you a better person in the sense of treating people more decent, decently. It's at least correlationally true, I think, not guaranteed. Um, so, so, you know, I wouldn't wor you don't have to worry about the bliss. You're, you're probably going to get happier if you go further along the path of mindfulness meditation. But it's, it's not the immediate goal of mindfulness meditation. So take us on the road to enlightenment. What is the checklist? Well, again, you know, Buddhist very diverse tradition. There are different meditation traditions, different, you know, there's Theravada Buddhism, Mahayana, and sub-traditions within them, Tibetan, and so on. Um, and, and they have different, and there are different conceptions of what enlightenment uh, amounts involves. Um, but I, I think pretty much common to all of them, an example of something I think you'd find implicit or explicit in pretty much all traditions is that it involves a recognition that the self is an illusion. The, the letting go uh, the idea that y you are this, um, uh, bear that there's this distinct core of your identity and that it's this like CEO that's running the show, um, that's a good example of um, uh, what is considered a, a, like a breakthrough insight that would be associated with enlightenment. And it has tremendous implications because I should say, if you'll, if you'll permit me, a little tangent, I mean, in, in, in Buddhism, there is this interesting distinction between the intellectual understanding of the claims of Buddhist philosophy, you can argue on behalf of the doctrine of not-self, and the experiential understanding, the, experi the direct apprehension of the truth of not-self. And that latter thing would certainly be involved in enlightenment, and I've had glimmers of it uh, myself, especially while on retreat. I'm not one of these people who claims that they've had the full-on not self-experience, but it, it can involve dramatic things like, I remember I was meditating once on retreat, and um, just suddenly, you know, I felt a tingling in my foot, and I heard a bird singing, and just suddenly it seemed like the tingling was no more part of me than, than the, the bird song, and the bird was no less a part of me than the tingling. It was like a dissolution of the bounds of self, that when you actually feel it is a pretty amazing thing, and of course it changes your relationship to the world. I mean, if you don't and, and this is uh, one of the great, like, moral payoffs of the not-self experience. The full-on not-self experience is that you would, in principle, cease to privilege your own interests over those of other people, would be, which would be completely radical. It's the ideal of a number of ethical systems, but, you know, try it and see how far you get. And, the and sort of, right. It's the sort of interconnectedness of the world, which brings us to the Matrix, because I don't know if you all saw the Keanu Reeves franchise, three movies of which have been uh, distributed, uh, the red pill uh, takes away his delusion. Yeah. Um, the Matrix, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's, uh, you know, it turns out that the, what we think of as human experience is actually all a dream. We're actually in these gooey pods, just like with our eyes closed, and these dreams are being puffed into our brains by these robots who have taken over. I mean, this 100 years, this may be, who knows. But anyway, in the movie, it's happened now. And it's funny that when that movie came out, a lot of kind of Western Buddhists uh, saw it as a so-called Dharma movie. You know, Dharma means the teaching of the, teaching of the Buddha, also the path you follow in response to those teachings. And they saw it as a metaphor because that, the, the, the Buddhist claim is dramatic. I mean, it says the, the, the world as you ordinarily perceive it is, in a sense, an illusion and not... I mean, there are only uh, m almost all forms of Buddhism 
and Buddhist philosophy are not saying that 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 it's true in the in 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 the complete sense that it's true in the movie The Matrix that it's just all not there, but the idea is that um, we are deeply deluded about the actual nature of reality, um, and uh, the delusion involves things like myself existing and also the sense that things have essences, which I could I could get into. But in any event. Um, the, you know, people who have practiced very seriously, the, the main point is they resonate to the claim that it's all an illusion because, I mean, that's a testament to how fundamentally a really sustained meditation practice, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't have a practice that deep right now, but I've gotten a glimpse of this like on retreat, um, a really deep meditation practice can transform your perception so thoroughly that you just go, I cannot believe I was walking around under the influence of that kind of consciousness. It was just, it was just wrong. It was just, I was making all these judgments about people on the basis of almost no evidence. I was wrong about the way my own mind works. Um, and this is a much truer and better way to view the world. Where, take us through this um, delineation again uh, between, because you're sounding almost supernatural, not exactly, but this idea of how do you, <coughs> regard the rebirth tradition or the, you know, some of the supernatural mm. aspects of Buddhism? Um, I actually don't treat them in the book. I, I wasn't brought up Buddhist or something, so I have no particular connection to them. I mean, I guess I'm technically agnostic. It's not, you know, it's not, <clears throat> it doesn't seem to me completely impossible. That uh, I mean, I think until we figure out what consciousness is, you know, I don't think you'll, there, are, there are a lot of exotic scenarios that I don't think you'll be able to take completely off the table, but I, I don't have any particular belief in them. Um, but the, uh, you know, the, the, the matrix scenario, um, I mean, there have been uh, Western philosophies, you know, Berkeley and so on, that made really extreme claims about the extent to which the reality of the world out there cannot be verified and is for, can for practical purposes be thought of as an illusion. So, I, I mean, I guess... You know, metaphysics is an important word. It's sometimes taken to be synonymous with like new age and woo and like non-scientific. But but no, I mean, philo philosophers here in America deal with metaphysics seriously and they examine claims about the nature of the self, the nature of our uh, perceptions, how real they are, to what extent are they constructed. And uh, so and, and metaphysics non-woo metaphysics, you might say, um, makes radical claims. Woo is claims. a technical term, Woo right? is a technical yeah, term. Right. I don't think I actually use in the book. But, um, <laughs> but, but um, my point is mainstream uh, metaphysics can involve radical claims. Buddhism makes radical claims, and, uh, and I defend them. Tell us about the evolution of your thinking. At what point did, did sort of modern science and modern psychology um, sort of overlay with what you knew about the ancient traditions in mindfulness meditation? Well, um, I wrote a book uh, almost 25 years ago called The Moral Animal in the early part of when evolutionary psychology was just becoming a term, and it was a, about evolutionary psychology. And I noticed that um, that made me um, more aware of the shortcomings of my own perception. I mean, remember, natural theory of natural selection says those traits that are best at getting genes into the next generation are the traits we will have, including mental traits, if they're grounded in the genes. It doesn't care whether they lead to accurate perception. If there's an illusion you can have that will get genes into the next generation, if the illusion that you are more morally, morally entitled than your neighbor will get genes into the next generation, any kind of illusion, a, a simple case, we, when, when, a, when a, 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 an object is approaching us rapidly, we tend to overestimate how fast it's moving. That's an illusion. Now, when you think about it, it makes sense because it's better to get out of the way too soon than, than too late, right? So that's like a better safe than sorry illusion that's apparently in our genes that, that, that helps genes get um, transmitted. So anyway, I, I, as I wrote the book about evolutionary psychology, I became aware of like how many, especially things in the moral realm, are really distortions of a clear view. But one thing I noticed is that knowing about them, being more aware of them, didn't by itself help me control them. Because evolutionary psychology is a statement about the way things are. It doesn't involve a practice, a discipline for actually dealing with these things. And 
what I realize is Buddhism actually makes much of the same descriptive claims about the human predicament as evolutionary psychology, but in, a, in, in addition to having a diagnosis, it, it has a prescription. It has something you can, you can uh, do about it. So for me, that was the big, I mean, that, I, that's probably what led me to, to pursue meditation and actually go to a retreat. Um, and how does it help us from an evolutionary psychology perspective to have this kind of tribalism hardwired into our brain, to have that kind of susceptibility? Um, I mean, I guess it's because the tribe protects us, arguably. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, in a way, tribalism is a misleading, I mean, in a way a misleading term. I mean, there weren't, during, you know, great bulk of human evolution took place during the hunter-gatherer phase, and there aren't tribes the way anthropologists describe them. There aren't these huge, you know, groups of people. But even within a hunter-gatherer society, or any society, there are coalitional conflicts, you and your friend versus three other people, and it may not be physical, it may not get to a point of physical fight, it may be a contest over resources, it may be the belief that you deserve some mate and somebody else doesn't, but, but there are contests between groups that have stakes in Darwinian terms, in genetic terms, and any way of thinking that makes you better at, uh, at getting the resources, including just arguing your case. You know, I mean, it's more and more recognized that our minds are just designed to make arguments on our behalf, which is different from being designed to see the world clearly. Our minds are just like our own personal lawyers, you know? And, um, and if that helped get genes into the next generation, then that will, that will be a thing. And, 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 and again, that's what's driving a lot. You know, you ask, why is it good for us? I think it's not good for us. I mean, that's another thing. Natural selection doesn't care about us per se. It cares about the genes. So even in a more natural environment than this, uh, these tribal impulses might bring immense suffering, but, but natural selection doesn't care about our happiness either. Well, and some of it can be very self-destructive. Yeah, I mean, especially in a modern environment. You see this with, like, you see uh, an impulse like rage, right? I mean, evolutionary psychologists think that rage is a designed by natural selection to do a certain thing, which is when you feel aggrieved, you stand up for yourself and you show that you're willing to fight, which, and even if you don't win the fight, you have demonstrated to your audience that they will pay a price for messing with you because you are willing to get into a fight. I mean, that's the kind of rough logic of rage. Well, in a modern environment, in a road rage, it just you know, makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, first of all, you may get killed. Secondly, there's no one watching who, is, who, who matters to you, right? There's no one... Who are, who are you trying to prove this to? You're never going to see any of the other drivers again. <laughs> and, yet, and yet the impulse, its original logic was to be a demonstration that doesn't make sense in this environment, and yet it persists. And, and we, we have all kinds of uh, feelings that... I've, I've demonstrated repeatedly to my children in the back seat how irrational I yeah, can yeah. be in traffic. And have they commented Stuck on it? Stuck in traffic. I believe they have. Yeah. Um, what about lust in a modern context? Well, lust is something that probably doesn't need a lot of explanation in Darwinian terms, right? I mean, you can see how it might lead you to get genes in the next generation. Um, it's like the rest, uh, you know, in the sense that, um, first of all, it never brings enduring gratification. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not against it necessarily, but, uh, uh, and... I mean, you mean compare a modern environment and a so-called natural right. environment? Right, in the context well, of, you know, I, I it mean, can be self-destructive, yeah. you are a slave to one, yeah. that well, passion. A, a perfect example of how absurd these impulses can become is pornography, right? I mean, there are people really addicted to pornography um, uh, because in the, uh, and it's a per more a male than a female affliction in ways that evolutionary psychologists think they have an explanation of, but in any event, you know, in the environment of revolution, a person with no clothes on was a person with no clothes on. So if natural selection designed us to respond to that pattern of information, then it made sense in Darwinian terms, at least in the sense that, yeah, that was a particular sex partner. And now you have this absurd situation of people sitting at home with computer screens, and you see just how pointless and ridiculous. He, and it's a serious problem for yeah. some people. You had a section called hatred as an addiction as well, which I thought was yeah, I mean, hatred is, uh, and again, with, you know, it's an interesting question, what is the, um, 
Well, I mean, just look at the things hatred sets in motion. If you feel the impulse of hatred toward someone, you might start having revenge fantasies, things you can do to them down as a favorite pastime of mine. Um, you <laughs> might, uh, I mean, I try for not to be, but, but um, or you might just think about unflattering things you could say about them. And again, in, in, if you imagine a hunter-gatherer society, it's like, you know, that's, if you've got somebody who's your mortal enemy, you want to undermine their status. That will help your status. Uh, and so you want to be able to say things about them that are unflattering. So you think of these unflattering things. So that's, those are the kinds of things that are set in motion when you feel hatred. And it's very difficult to, like, when you feel hatred, to, like, just stop and observe it mindfully. But if you do that, successfully, then it won't lead to those things and it won't get that kind of reinforcement. And it, I think in your book, it's quite clear that what you're saying, it's not just about neutralizing these cravings or about the woo, the, you know, loving kindness aspect of it, but about really sort of getting a self-awareness that allows you to control some of these. Yeah. Now, now there, is, there is a kind of meditation called meta meditation or loving kindness meditation that is specifically oriented toward cultivating emotional empathy for people, including yourself, um, and that's fine, but, but yeah, I, I think uh, even, I mean, that doesn't come all, that doesn't, I haven't had tremendous success with that kind of meditation, um, but, uh, I, I, but, but, but what I want to say is just kind of ordinary, um, ordinary mindfulness um, meditation, I think, has some of the same benefits. It lessens your, your harsh judgments of people. It can make you more, just to calm down, uh, be less governed by your kind of reactive feelings, I think can bring uh, compassion. Um, and, and so I think e either way you can, you can become a better person. I was handed this iPad because we're going to um, get questions from the audience and from our online audience huh. as well. So th think through. But this comes very well um, dovetails off of what you're just saying. April from Beijing um, asks you a question. Uh, a lot of what you write has to do with morality and how we can become better people. What's the connection between mindfulness and becoming more moral? Okay. I, I, uh, first of all, again, it's not, um, it's not an automatic connection. And there, and, and there have been meditation teachers who I think reached great depths of mindfulness uh, who use their meditative prowess to sexually exploit students and things, that can happen. Um, and that's one reason that in Buddhism, there's a whole set of ethical teachings that accompanies uh, the meditative practice and is kind of part of the path to enlightenment. That said, I think mindfulness does tend to make uh, people better. First of all, just by calming, calming down. I mean, how many times have you done, behaved in a way towards someone that you regretted, and it was just because you weren't calm enough? Right? So calming down is moral progress. Mm. But in the extremes, if you get to the uh, extremes of, and, and another radical Buddhist concept is the concept of so-called emptiness or the idea that things don't have essences. Um, if I can just quickly say, one of my more profound uh, retreat experiences was to come upon a kind of weed that I had spent a certain amount of my time trying to kill because it was in my front lawn, and just suddenly going like, why have I tried to kill this? It's, it's exactly as beautiful as the other plants in the forest. Now, at one level, that's a trivial observation. In other words, we know that weed is an arbitrary category. Weed isn't written in the DNA. It's just our culture has defined certain things as weeds. But when you have the experiential apprehension, when that category breaks down in, a, in an experiential way, you're no longer seeing essence of weed. That's what emptiness is. And it's not a bad thing. Emptiness sounds like this negative thing. No, it's like all things are equally beautiful. And when you, pers when you do that with people, when you view a rival or an enemy from that context, and the, and the essence of enemy or essence of rival drains away, uh, then that transforms the way you deal with them. It doesn't mean, by the way, that, we, that you'll quit worrying about punishing bad people or anything like that. Um, it doesn't mean that you relax all moral judgment, in a sense. but. Um, but, but mindfulness, the, the moral benefits can range from calmness to, a, to, to just a, a tremendously lessened sense of judgment, a less reflexive sense of judgment, to in the extreme case, this kind of thing where the essences that, these negative essences just drop out of things. Um, do we have an audi audience member here who's interested in asking a question? 
Uh, let's go here. Uh, if if uh, Buddhism is true, is is it the only religious philosophy that is true, or are all other religious philosophies as true? Are some more or less true? I'm specifically interested in, uh, say, Advaita Vedanta yeah. or, or Patanjali Yoga, for yeah. that matter. Yeah, I mean, short answer is, uh, I mean, I, in, at the very beginning of the book, I'm mindful as I was of the perils of a title like this. I have several things I, I want to get clear on. One of them is that. It doesn't mean that other traditions aren't true. You know, the Dalai Lama, whom I quote at this point, said, don't, don't use Buddhism to become a better Buddhist. Use it to become a better whatever you are. So, and also I would say, again, I'm not dealing with the religious side. You might see a, contra you know, a contradiction between rebirth and the Christian notion of the afterlife, but I'm not, I'm not dealing with that realm anyway. And, and I would say that the things I am dealing with are compatible with religious traditions broadly. I know there's a, uh, an emeritus at Union Theological Seminary, which I have an affiliation, who uh, wrote a book called Without the Buddha, I, I Could Not Be a Christian. He considers himself a Christian Buddhist. Now, as far as... Uh, Advaita Vedanta, the, this is a, a Hindu tradition, um, there are cases where you would have a difference of philosophical interpretation. I mean, first of all, um, Advaita means non-dual. Okay, so the, I, th that experience I described when my, the bounds of myself kind of broke down, that's like kind of the beginning of a non-dual experience where the, the distinction between the me and the it just breaks down. That's non-dual. Now, in Advaita Vedanta, meditation, there can be experiences that I think are essentially the same as a Buddhist meditator uh, would have along those lines, a sense of unity, a sense that the self is broken down. The philosophical uh, interpretation might be different. So Buddhism, because of the notion of not self, it would say, well, it isn't that I'm one with everything, it's that everything is in some sense emptiness. That might be the philosophical interpretation, whereas with uh, Vedanta, the interpretation might be, well, there's been a merging you know, of Atman and Brahman, or a merging of kind of my self or soul with the universal soul. That's a difference of interpretation, and there, there there's a difference. It's a difference of philosophy that maybe there would be arguments about, but I actually believe that the, both the experiences themselves are probably essentially identical, and in a sense, the moral payoff of the experiences uh, are probably basically the same. And I would say that even with something like Christian mysticism, where, where you have a, a sense of profound union with the divine, again, that that's probably, I, I don't know, it's conjectural, but that might also have a lot in common with these experiences. So there are places where disagreement can arise between certain traditions that make really specific philosophical claims, but I, I think that, by and large, you could take the part of Buddhism I'm focusing on and, uh, and, and bring it into uh, a Christian or Jewish or Muslim or, or um, I mean, ironically, Hindu, Hinduism is the one where you might see the kind of friction I've described precisely because Hinduism and Buddhism have, you know, the Buddha was born a Hindu apparently, and, so, and there is so much in common with the philosophies that there are these specific points of, of difference of interpretation. Um, one more hand over here, yes? Has there been any uh, research on how meditation changes the limbic system or the amygdala in the brain? Um, there, there, there have been. I, I, don't, I don't spend a ton of time on the psychological studies in the book, but there, there certainly, uh, I'm pretty sure you could find things where the amygdala, which is generally associated with like fear, threat, and so on, um, kind of uh, gets a little more passive. A, a thing I focus on in the book having to do with these brain scans is, is the so-called uh, default mode network, which, which is the, um, it's a network of parts of the brain that tend to get active when the mind is wandering. And the mind tends to wander whenever you're not uh, just focused on something specific, you know, working toward a deadline, playing a sport, reading a novel. If you don't have something directly engaging, the human mind just tends to wander, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it's, it's something that you have to deal with if you're going to try to do mindfulness meditation because you're going to try to, even though you're not playing a sport or anything, you try to focus on one thing, like your breath. Um, and there certainly have been studies showing that with, you know, meditators of great attainment, the default mode network, this thing associated with the wandering of the mind, gets much, much calmer. There's even a, there's somebody I describe in the book who uh, his, his default mode network was quiet just as a matter of course before he even started 
uh, meditating, according to this uh, study he participated in. Um, but there is, there is a lot of uh, work in this field. And, uh, you know, I'd say it's showing about what you'd expect. Um, I'm going to go to the, ma uh, what is this thing called? Uh, tablet. Because uh, uh, there's another great question from Katerina from Long Island. Uh, and she says, the cri crisis of the Rohingya people has shown the world that Buddhism can have a militant aspect, mm -hmm. just as other faiths have shown, despite its very benevolent image. Should we be surprised that there is militant Buddhism in the world? Um, probably not. I mean, people, uh, it gets, I, I mean, people, you, you commonly hear this, like, if meditation is so great for you, you know, why is this happening? Again, first thing to say is most Buddhists in Asia don't meditate. Now, there are, there are specific uh, places where there's something of a tradition of lay meditation, but it's the exception. There are a lot, even monks who don't meditate. Um, uh, the other thing is you, um, you know, in other words, in Asia, Buddhism is more like what you might think of as a traditional religion than the way people, and some people in America, think of this kind of Western Buddhism. Um, so it really shouldn't surprise you that much. Of course, the teachings of Buddhism are, uh, you know, emphasize not harming other beings. Then again, there are a lot of Christian teachings that, uh, you know, Christians, you know, don't always adhere to. Subscribe it's the nature, to. It's the nature of... Um, of religions for, for uh, you know, it to, to be that way. And one thing about religion is it becomes a group you identify with. This is, if, if it's part of your ethnic identity to be a Buddhist or in anything else, then, then the tribalistic impulses can get activated in a situation where you see another group as a threat. If it's the case that most Buddhists in Asia don't meditate, how did the idea of meditation and mindfulness germinate so strongly in what you often yeah. refer to in the book as Western Buddhism? Yeah. Um, it's interesting. Um, well, first of all, Buddhism has reached uh, the West through several different kind of conduits. So kind of Zen hit the West Coast. I mean, it's reached America through several different conduits. Zen hit the West Coast in kind of 50s, 60s. In the 70s, a form of Tibetan kind of a fusion of kind of a, a Tibetan and some other things got a foothold in, uh, especially in Colorado. And then the tradition I am most associated, uh, I'm most familiar with, and I write about in the book, um, uh, Theravadan Buddhism um, uh, got a foothold initially in the East, uh, and, and that's particularly associated with, with uh, mindfulness. And that is actually the one, of the three, I would say that's the one that actually derives from a part of Asia where lay meditation had... Uh, gathered a foothold. So in Burma, for example, uh, an interesting ha thing happened as a result of British colonialism, which is that, you know, I don't know what it was, like 130, 40 years ago. I, I, I don't know the dates exactly, but uh, there was such a fear that British uh, dominance was going to destroy uh, the existing, the indigenous cultural tradition that as a form of resistance... They started teaching uh, both precepts of Buddhism more, more kind of aggressively to lay people, but also started teaching meditation. And meditation became a thing that lay people did. And the, the, the kind of um, uh, Buddhism that is like at the Insight Meditation Society, where I've done my retreat, Spirit Rock on the West Coast, which is an, uh, 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 an offshoot of IMS, um, that derives from an Asian uh, tradition that really is associated with a certain amount of lay meditation. From Burma. From yeah, Burma. Burma. And you, you also see, they also draw on Thailand in, in particular. But, but Burma is this very clear-cut example of a kind of a, 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 you know, a, a revival of a grassroots, or at least a, the creation of grassroots meditation tradition in the fairly recent past in uh, Asia. It's fascinating. Uh, I have a hand here and, yes, in the back. We'll do both. Hi, thank you for uh, sharing with us today. Uh, my question is pretty simple. Uh, other than your own book, what book have you gifted most? Have I gifted most? Yeah. Given to people? Yep. Oh, you may be overestimating my generosity, first yeah. of all. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, well, let him answer unless he wants to uh, maybe, buy a little maybe time. Maybe to think about that. While okay, you ask then maybe you ask um, the next. I, I mean, are, are you interested in Buddhist books in particular? That 
I mean, it, it, as far as books, I a few books I think are great. Uh, I was just thinking. Are it, there any books that you reread? Well, a book I've gone back and looked at it. There's a fascinating little book by Erwin Schrödinger, the physicist, the quantum physicist from a long, early 20th century. And what's interesting about it is that it's it's two little books that are generally published together. And one is called What is Life? And he was one of the first people to start talking about like information and entropy and, and defining life in those terms. But then it, that is paired with a, uh, an essay that I think is called Mind and Matter. But in any event, it turns out he has a very Eastern side. It's, he's not the only physicist who does. But that's a, just a very Eastern um, reflection, a uh, philosophical reflection from, from a Western physicist. And, and, uh, American? Uh, well, Schrodinger, I think, was uh, must have been European, uh, but I don't know exactly if anybody know with Schrodinger. Is that like a German or Austrian? German, German yeah. Uh, another question in the audience? To yes. what extent oh. is all passionate attachment considered an obstacle to Buddhist ideals, including if the attachment is towards a spouse or towards a mother? Yeah. Um, you know, in principle, if you actually attained enlightenment, and I am personally agnostic on the question of whether any living, living person has. Okay, there are people who say they've attained enlightenment, and then there are people who may secretly think they've attained enlightenment but are wise enough not to make that claim. Um, <laughs> I personally think that, that if, you're, you know, if you look in the ancient Buddhist texts and really look at what they're describing, how extreme uh, an achievement it would be, I'm not sure anyone ever has. And I've talked to people who say they've attained enlightenment, and I'm not sure they have all the hallmarks that you would, you would expect. But the answer to your question is yes, you would have let go of all attachments. And this sounds like creepy, you know, right? I mean, will I not be attached to my children? You know, um, and I'd say uh, a couple of things. First of all, as a practical matter, you don't have to worry. It's not going to happen to you. I mean, you're not going to get that far. Um, secondly, some lessening of attachment can be a very good thing in a parent. Uh, as many of you will probably, I'm a parent, and I could use less. And I don't mean just in terms of reducing my own suffering. It, it, it would often be good for the child if you were less attached. Um, and, and, uh, and so I, I, I guess I'd say there is a point beyond which the lessening of attachment seems creepy. Now, if you got there, it might not seem creepy to you, and you might be a wonderful person, and it might not be a problem. But in any event, I don't think any of us has to worry <laughs> about getting beyond the point where it might seem creepy. Uh, you know there's an entire parenting uh, methodology known as attachment parenting. I know. Did you have a question in the front? Yeah. So meditation has gotten really pervasive in America. Um, what do you feel like is the biggest obstacle for e everyone or this philosophy to be adopted by everyone? Well, I mean, ironically, one thing I've come to appreciate since I wrote my book is that in some contexts, the word Buddhism is a problem. So, for example, if you're at a local school board, in various towns in America and you're advocating that they teach mindfulness to the children, I recommend that you not call it Buddhist because uh, they will think of it as a religion that is incompatible with their own religious tradition. So, um, and so that's one reason I'm fine with, you know, I, I actually just had a conversation with John Cabot Zinn on this. Uh, I run a website called Meaning of Life TV and I just taped a conversation with him uh, that, that will air, I guess, uh, it's coming Friday maybe. Um, and he is the, he, he's the person who came up with mindfulness-based stress reduction. And he has brought this, uh, mindfulness into a lot of institutional settings, the workplace and schools and so on, that it might not have gotten uh, had he attached the word uh, Buddhism, although he himself came at it from a totally Buddhist vantage point. In fact, he had his great epiphany about mindfulness-based stress reduction while on retreat at the Insight Meditation Society, where I've done my retreats. And so that's, that's an issue. Um, and, and I think it's great for mindfulness to be taught under whatever label. Um, as a practical matter for people, th there's the problem of just sustaining the practice. And there's various little tricks 
Uh, you know, Dan uh, has this new book, In Addition to 10% Happier, your colleague wrote a book called uh, Meditation for Fidgety, Fidgety Skeptics, Skeptics, I think, that, that, that uh, you know, helps you kind of deal with. And he has an app, just to be shamelessly plugging it, um, called 10% Happier, and it's guided meditation. Yeah. And I, I and, and it plugs you into some of the teachers that I've worked many, with. Yes, the, many, yes. Uh, some of, of them, them at are, IMS. Yes, yeah. and what's nice about it is it's male voices, female voices. There's everything from... Uh, body awareness to yeah. anti-stress to a bunch of different things. But to layer this question from Billy uh, in Brooklyn who says he's very interested in mindfulness and meditating more often, how important is it to learn more about Buddhism itself? I know very little, he says, which is sort of the opposite of her question. I would say you don't have to learn the Buddhism to start. <laughs> um, and... Uh, it depends on how intellectually curious you are and how far down the path you go. I mean, I think, um, I, I think you know, Buddhism makes really interesting claims about uh, the connection of our between our minds and the reality we think we're perceiving. And so, I recommend, uh, you know, if people are intellectually curious, and I think it can deepen your commitment to meditation. It can definitely work that way. Now, the ancient texts themselves are can be a little opaque. But there's lots of books that, that try to unpack them. Yes, right here. Yeah. I have a question. Since tribalism seems to be bringing us to the edge of extinction as a race, something that Charles Darwin and the movement he fathered would not be happy about, um, do you... Would you say that mindfulness meditation might be an antidote to extreme tribalism that might keep us from blowing ourselves up as a civilization? Yeah, I mean, I am, I'm evangelical. It may be because I was brought up Southern Baptist, but I, <laughs> I you know, I wrote a book called Non-Zero in which I uh, kind of told the story of humankind from Hunter Gather Day's to being on the brink of forming a global community. Mm -hmm. And my view is if we don't form a cohesive global community, the whole thing may, in one yeah. sense, you know, at best dissolve in chaos and maybe even worse. Um, because there are so many, there's a growing number of so-called non-zero-sum problems that we can only solve in concert, not just environmental ones, all kinds of them. Um, and increasingly, I think that uh, for humanity to get across this threshold, and we are, as you know, nowhere near crossing the threshold to a cohesive global community, um, it's going to require a, maybe a transformation almost on the part of humankind. I mean, maybe humankind pretty broadly is going to have to pass through some kind of threshold uh, that maybe you could call uh, if you wanted to be, make it sound very secular, like metacognition, in other words, we have to become more aware of how our minds work and how they mislead us. And you're seeing this. You, you know, the, the whole term cognitive bias, that's like become a term you read. And, so, and that's progress. That's good. But I do think that just hearing about the problem uh, doesn't by itself solve it. Mm -hmm. And mindfulness meditation is, I think, not the only tool, but a great tool. Um, and so I, I, I think, you know, it may, it may not be too much to say that the planet's salvation demands that humankind broadly make what you could call spiritual progress that, that can occur within any religious tradition or uh, any secular, you know, or a secular tradition. But uh, I think that may be what's demanded of us. Yes. And then in the back with the hat. I mean, I'm just curious if you have an um, opinion. Is, is yoga true? And I can see where, um, you know, perhaps it's complimentary, but maybe it's yoga's about me. I'm doing the handstand and feeling the dopamine, and I'm not yeah. approaching non-duality, but it's more about enhancing oneself yeah. as opposed to yeah. mindful meditation. Well, well, first of all, I, I'm not a yoga expert. It's like this one little thing that supposedly is good for your back. I do that. Uh, <laughs> Now, yoga, there are different kinds of yoga. Uh, some of them do integrate, uh, you know, like mindfulness per se, uh, and, and there's that connection. But I would also say that even... Uh, what connection, sir? Mindfulness. I mean, I mean there, there are forms of, of yoga where, the, where part of the deal is to become more aware of your body, which is a form of mindfulness. It isn't just feelings that you become mindful of. I mean, if you go back and look at the ancient foundational text on mindfulness, 
Um, it, you become more mindful of everything, including your body, your, your thoughts, your feelings, and so on. Um, but I would say that uh, what you said is that, well, isn't yoga kind of about the self? Well, in the beginning, meditation is about the self. I mean, people start meditating because they have a problem. It, 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 it typically starts off as self-help, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, they have anxiety, they have whatever. Um, and it's one of the great features of it that what begins as self-help can draw you down a path that makes you more selfless. Um, so I don't, I don't think people should apologize for wanting to get something out of it, even though it's true that being like determinedly goal-oriented as you sit down and meditate will, can get in the way, and there's, teachers will emphasize that, uh, and, and that's right. But people start meditating for a reason, and it has to do with them. Uh, yes, in back. I guess I'm not exactly clear what's the difference between Buddhism, mindfulness, and the Enlightenment project as conceived in the West. I mean, one has to be reflective on, on everything about one. Is it basically a technique that Buddhism offers? I don't see exactly what, what at least as you're presenting it, what Buddhism is offering that, that, that the Enlightenment project doesn't offer. Well, first of all, these two radical philosophical claims, not self and emptiness. There was one Enlightenment philosopher, David Hume, who kind of got into the idea of not self, but it's not associated with the Enlightenment. Um, and I would say this gets back to this piece I just wrote in Wired about Steve Pinker's book, is that, you know, his, his whole book, Enlightenment Now, is like if we'll just stay true to the path laid out by Western, the Western Enlightenment, we can save humankind. We can solve all these problems. We can think rationally. And I said, I don't think that's true, because the, the Western Enlightenment does not offer a technique. I mean, Enlightenment philosophers were a, at least somewhat aware, Hume was, certainly, of the way passions influence thinking and so on, and they were aware of, in a, some sense, of tribalism and all that. But it does not offer a systematic technique um, for uh, addressing it. Um, and so I think you need a, 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 a melding. I mean, the Western Enlightenment project has a lot to be said for it, but by itself, I don't think it's really complete as a prescription. Um, yes, here uh, and then in the back. The Have you heard um, people say that Buddhism undermines ambition and that countries that are predominantly Buddhist are less successful because of their... In mindfulness? Um, well, first of all, there are a lot of countries with a Buddhist tradition that uh, have no shortage of productivity. Um, so I don't think empirically uh, you would need to um, worry about that. Now, now, the idea that it may sap your ambition is a common concern. Like, if I start meditating, will I no longer be as ambitious? Um, first of all, if you get there, you won't care. <laughs> it's like, uh, that's the whole point. Um, secondly, I, I, I'm not aware of, and I know people who have gone well down, way further down the path than I have gone. Uh, I'm not aware of any who have, like, lost ambition. I'm aware of people whose, whose missions may have changed. They, they may have uh, may be less maniacally devoted to conventional career achievement and um, and material uh, you know material gain um, but they may be spending their time trying to convince people to meditate or something I mean I uh, um, you know and, and then it may you know it may be or, or they may just I mean again it's one of those things like losing your attachments where you know, as a, as a practical matter, like losing all ambition, even if it's a theoretical possibility, don't worry about getting there. I mean, a more likely thing is you might uh, be, um, you know, in your 30s and, and determined to get that promotion or something, and you might become a little, it's possible you could become a little less determined to get it. You might spend more time with your family or more time doing charity work or something. That's possible. Uh, it would be okay with me, and again, the point is, it will be okay with you once you get there, even if before you get there, you find it terrifying. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Wright. Um, I have two questions that you could take a pick, I guess. 
Um, so I'm curious about uh, emptiness and what it means if you could talk more about it. And uh, the second question is, is meditation uh, the best way to a selfless, more aware existence? Okay. Um, yeah, the, uh, on emptiness, I mean, again, it gets back to this idea that it's, it's that things don't have essence. Now, essence isn't something we realize we're attributing to things uh, until it's gone. Until I saw it drop out of that weed, I didn't realize the category of weed. I had been I, there was a plant that I considered an enemy, you know, and 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 it really shaped the way I perceived it. Um, and it, it gets back to this idea that affect feeling just pervasively colors our perceptions. It's like as somebody said, there's no such thing as an immaculate perception, right? It's like <laughs> they, they always come. They tend to come with really subtle judgments. And, and it's so subtle. And this is the sense in which you can talk seriously about life being illusory or, or, or a delusion is that the, the, the coloring is so subtle you don't realize it, but it influences the way you interact with things so much. Now, emptiness, it's not, it's not something I, have, I go through life feeling. But again, I know people I've talked to who do, and, and they describe it like there's a sense in which they can still tell, like, what's a TV monitor and what's a desk and what's a person and who's my wife and who's not. But the things are in some sense less sharply uh, delineated. And the, and, and the other thing that they, they tend to say is there's like a positive vibe about all of them. It, it, it's like there's some kind of feeling of positive energy. or So it's not, it's not um, a bad thing. Now, the, the, your, your second... Uh, uh, question was, um, well, about not self and awareness. Uh, okay, so am I getting a wrap it up signal there? Uh, no, we're that's close. not a wrap it we're up close, signal. Yeah. It's close well, to it. Well, I have one last question. We have five minutes left, and we're going to sort of end it here, which is, um, you know, downstairs in the lobby, I walked in, there's Buddha <laughs> statues everywhere. Yeah. And talk for just a moment about the historical Buddha and, and the intent or not that he had to unleash this sort of faith tradition. Okay. Um, let me quickly interject something I wish I'd said in response to the enlightenment question, which is that I think one thing that's underappreciated about the ideal of enlightenment is the extent to which it is a perfectly objective view of the world in a sense. I mean, some people might object with that word for certain reasons, but it is, it is just a view. You could almost, there's a phrase, the view from nowhere you hear in philosophy sometimes. It's just a view uncolored uh, by self-interest and therefore more uh, objective uh, view. The, um, uh, now, as for the Buddha, well, as a, um, you know, coming at it from just a, uh, in terms of what non-Buddhist, just scholars of religious history, philosophical history would say is, we don't know much about the historical Buddha. Same thing they'd say about Jesus um, and Muhammad. Uh, uh, you might say we know less about the Buddha as an historical matter, if you're coming from outside the tradition, than we do about Jesus. Because, you know, with Jesus we have stories that we know were written within a few decades of the life. They were put down on paper within a few decades. Uh, there's nothing like that with the Buddha. Um, I, the earliest uh, things we actually have physical remnants are these kind of like um, milestone things or something that the Emperor Ashoka spread around his empire that are very, uh, you know, ethically, uh, we, you know, uh, very enlightened ethically things attributed to the Buddha. Um, and, you know, and different Buddhists have different interpretations of, of what the Buddha meant. And, and, of course, the different Buddhist traditions have different canons. There's the Theravada canon, Mahayana canon. There's a lot of overlap between them, but they're not exactly the same. So I, I per my, my position is one of agnosticism on what uh, the Buddha... Uh, actually said, but, 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 but it is possible to characterize very early Buddhist tradition and the claims it makes. And, and, and yeah, it's commitment to ending suffering, uh, the view of human psychology and of metaphysics that's associated with that. Um, and so that's what I... Um, Those are foundational. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much for letting thank us you. glimpse inside your Thanks brain. For uh, it was so interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Not at all. Not at all. Thank you for being here.